You wanna hold it? Alright, there you go. Yeah. Focus it on him. Okay. This is my daughter. Move around as well. I'll move around okay. as well. Okay. So I think we know the reason why we're here. Which we didn't show us uh promo out there and start with people that we should come here and gather and listen to the man that we pay. Take get other people to put the reason to move that country forward. But before we get started, I'd like us to be on our on our feet for an opening opening prayer, please. All right. I'd like to invite Dr. Babalola for a short opening prayer for us, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this awesome moment. We thank you because we know you've been wondering yourself where we're going to take control of the terrible situation in our country. As we take this step forward by faith, we pray, Father Lord, that you will use this dimension that our brother, Omo Yeshu is representing. We pray that we will not be only the flag they are of our honest expectation, but it will also be <clears throat> the tool that we use as a divine intervention to really make things right in Nigeria. We do not want to shed blood in Nigeria, but Father Lord, we know those who really make peaceful revolution impossible, they themselves, they are really asking for solution. But with your intervention, we know Lord, things can be resolved smoothly. We want things to move smoothly in our country. We want a leadership that will really galvanize the whole country. That those who presently are even sojourning abroad will not hesitate to come home to contribute to the restorative process. And as we deliberate today, Father, that we pray that your wisdom will take control. And that Lord, it will be a very useful uh, interaction to them. And we thank you for our brother. He's been all over the world, jetting, traveling, everything. We pray for strength. When the tired father, we pray that you give you, you give him divine energy to continue. Amen. So that this struggle, Father, it will not be just a physical struggle, but it will be a struggle that because you are also empowering him, he will not feel tired. He will be strong all the time. You will feed him both good, nutritious, physical food and great spiritual faith. And it will remain strong to the very end. We pray for victory. In fact, we are thanking you, Lord, ahead, that he's not just here to just speak as a man, that he's not only our president in waiting, but going to be the president for truth. Blessed be your mighty name, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Shall we have our seat? But again, we are going to stand up again for our lovely, first and foremost, we start with uh, the Nigerian National Anthem. Some of us can still remember to sing it. It doesn't matter how, how bad the country is right now. I see some of us have said, we can't sing that song again. We must sing that song again. That land belongs to us. It's our fatherland. It does not matter how hard it is. Let that song bring Joy back to us again. Shall we rise and sing the national anthem? And after that, you may stand it while we sing the Australian national anthem as well. We kick off with the Nigerian national anthem.
switch over to the Australian National Anthem. Please remain standing. women, which is really what we need. But check Nigeria, all the ministers we have there, about three women, the rest are men. That's why when it's fight in the house, you see the women take off. How can three women wage war against those men with their brothers? So we need this, and those are the things we want to take back. We want to take equality back. Put your hands together for yourself. No more discrimination. There should be equality in the city. to just rise to honor those who have lost their lives in Nigeria. People are dying, as you know, there's still killings in Nigeria happening right now in some part of Nigeria. Some are dying for a purpose, for a cause. For some of us who are privileged and opportunity to be in a place like this, those are our people. We should carry them along. I want us to stand on our feet and just one minute of silence for people who have lost their lives in Nigeria, all over the world, fighting for justice, for a cause. And most especially for three members of AAC who were traveling from a meeting in Delta State, they lost their lives. They then ran into a river. And Pastor Jones, Mr. Idris, and Mr. Ernest, they all Delta State, they worry, and they lost their lives. And this is for a cause, for the nation. Shall we bow ahead for one minute respect, please? The 
Thank you very much. May their gentle soul rest in perfect peace. You can have a seat now. All right. Again, I just want to acknowledge people sitting here today and those who did not make the time to come out here for the support so far. The journey has just begun. We are in a race. Please don't give up yet. Talk to your friends, your family to vote wisely. Because me, I tell them from my video that the soup will sour and it's true. But we need to add something to something. That's why we put water to yesterday's soup. But these guys, they are old cargoes, they need to go. Please, there are people amongst us here today who made it possible for this event to happen. And we're not just going to make sure is here, he flew, he's been flying around the world, both in Nigeria and outside Nigeria, and he's working tirelessly to make sure he reach out to everyone. But again, there are other people, stakeholders, and then the followers who are also making it possible for him to achieve this dream. With that, I'd like to just mention some people in the house. If your name was not mentioned, it doesn't mean that we don't recognize you. It doesn't mean that you're not part of us. But the fact that you are sitting here, you are here to fight the cause. And we really appreciate you. But you just wanted to say, few people who have made it possible for this event to happen, they are one of the stakeholders. I just want to mention their name quickly. And volunteers too, who also make it up to their time to decorate this place, to make sure all the equipment are ready, the PA system, to make sure that we you know when we do Thanksgiving in church, after Thanksgiving we do tax chopping. So which means there's gonna be something flowing through our mouth. All these things have been, have come out of out of people's personal pocket. And that is not easy. For you to dip hand into your pocket and bring that to grace this event. May the Lord continue to refill your pocket in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to call on people, and they're here. Some of us are also here because they go work. Um, the state oldest perth I have here are Genius, Ugwamba, Benga Ojomo, myself, Wesley, Frank Bademose, Professor Tade, Engineer Angus, Chidibere, Halima, Maduka. Dr. Dele Babalola himself, Professor Ebenezer, Shulari, Prof. Joy James, Oladi Job, Perry, Ralph Peters, Richard Amodu, Pastor Stanford, and Tommy Adebayo. These guys have been hiding behind the closet, working tirelessly to make sure we are here gathered this afternoon. Put your hands together for these people for your time. And now I want to quickly reference, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, and then it came under the, the second page. Um, first of all, you are Kazi, Dauda, and Mr. Paul. These are all part of the stakeholders. It was just handling my second page. I didn't say that. I apologize. Um, the volunteers who made it possible for us to be having this moment. Then other people than uh, Mrs. Shilom, Pat, Mrs. Adeboye, Halima, Edith, Kwaba, Ogechi, Esther O, Yika O, Yeti O. When I was getting all these schools, I said, is this a family? <laughs> Families are there. But that's good. I can see all the O's coming out. O is a very universal blood group. They do it very well. So that's good. <laughs> Mrs. Esther Force and Uyenka Ayoku. Put your hands together for this lovely people. And we have taken time to make sure we are getting um, enough of our time today. And then again, I just want to quickly reference the overseas supporters you have as well, Mr. Moyele Shore. These are the ones we have in prayer, but there are people who are strongly behind the movement. In as much as I am one of those people in the platform, I also belong to other platforms in those state and other state. And we will do, you know, brainstorm and say a lot of things. These guys, I just want to quickly mention, Usain De Wogere, the Obamedo of UK Birmingham. That guy is strongly behind you. Um, Igo Daro, aka Daro, you probably would have met these people. The, the, as I mentioned, the name, he rings the bell. David C. Gorola, aka Ocean. Dr. Greg of Nigeria. Joy Omorebe, Nigeria, is South North, North Chapter. You can see the ladies highly involved. 
lips are taking, they're taking it back. And of course, the list goes on for the people, the amount of people that you've got, and to all the AAC party members and supporters, we say thank you for your time and for the support for this platform. I want to quickly introduce this man to you. And uh, I kind of wrote something a little bit about him, which I put together, but if certain things, if they're wrong, please, we will readjust this. We are we are readjusting, but I have to put this together quickly, but I'm going to let you show you. When you go on social media, you will hear all sorts of stories about this guy. Some people will say good about him, some people will say this guy is a radical. I will going to have a mafia that will beat him now. But I always I tell people, look back to history, because we think we've lost our history. We're not going back to history. I look at one post a few days ago on social media, and I saw on my election already, standing behind late MK Abiola, and he was very young. And I said, wow. Which means this guy has been fighting for a cause for nearly 30 years. Nigeria is 58. This guy has been fighting for a movement for 30 years, minus 30 from 58. How many have you got left? That is not a rocket science, which means you only got 28 left. For someone to still be fighting consistently, persistent, and consciously, don't you guys think that that's a cause? I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a match to be reckoned with. And I wrote a little paragraph about this guy. And I said, what kind of a man is this guy? What can a man do? One man that can motivate, inspire, and give his people a reason to hope and believe in their country once again. Who is this man? Is no other person than Omoyele Shoure. Mr. Shoure is an indigenous of Ekwondo State in southwest Nigeria. He was born February 16, 1971, in Niger Delta region of the country where he was also raised. He studied geography and regional planning at the University of Lagos and hold a master's degree in public administration from Columbia University. He teaches modern African history at the City University of New York and post-colonial African history at the School of Art, New York. A human rights activist, pro-democracy campaigner, and of course you all know, he is the founder of an online news agency called Sahara Reporters. Please help me stand up. Make a stand-up ovation as I introduce to you this very lovely man, the presidential candidate for African Action Congress come 2019 Nigeria presidential elections, Mr. Omoya Nesowari. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Thank you, uh, Australia, thank you people of the city of Perth for bringing me over here. Thank you the organizers of uh, today's event. Um, I should say that uh, when I was studying geography and planning at the University of Lagos, I never thought that one day I would end up doing the excursion I refused to do when I was in university, which was to come to Australia. Uh, it's, uh, when our professor was teaching us about Australia, they said it's the end of the world, so don't bother to do this. Uh, but, uh, and I got to tell you that coming here is truly the end of the world. How did I find out? I got to Australia on the map an Emirates uh, aircraft and thought we had arrived. It took another five hours to get to Bristol. I said, you know, this has got to be the true end of the world. But I've had so much love and support since I arrived here, it makes me feel it's the beginning of the world. Thank you so much for making it happen. Uh, one of the things that I saw when I got here is how important it is that you know we develop our country. I came here, uh, and every city I've been Brisbane, Melbourne, and Sydney, as I said, totally the place was designed, it fell from the sky. You, know, you wouldn't even think that this place was developed by human beings. 
reason is that that is what we are made to feel at home, that it's impossible to do anything. It's impossible to make roads. It's impossible to have hospitals that are working. It's impossible to have housing system for the poor. It's impossible for us to have education. But something has been wrong with Nigeria. Because today is Sunday, uh, you know, I'm not particularly a religious person, I should say, but I've read the story of uh, Jacob and Esau, right? And it tallied with what happened to Nigerians. It was that you all know about how Jacob uh, and Esau, Esau lost his, uh, his birthright to Jacob. And when we were taught that story in the Bible, we always felt that Esau, I mean, Jacob was someone of a schemer, right? He was this guy who, you know, made his brother lose his bad right, and somehow you hate Jacob, somehow you have pity for Esau. And, but in the case of Nigeria, there's a parallel as well. And the parallel for me is that that story isn't complete until you look at the transaction. The problem was that there was an offer made to Esau by Jacob to sell his bad rights, and he accepted it and took the price and walked away. It is the same thing that I think happened to Nigeria. There was an offer made to us to pauperize us. There's an offer made to us to oppress us. There's an offer made to us to drive us out of the country to the furthest lands around the world, and we accepted it. Uh, I don't know how we accepted it, but the result is that if we didn't accept it, we could have taken back our bad rights for the last 58 years, which is what we are trying to do now, and we must make happen. Uh, I've told you that story not because we make exact sense, but because it's the driving force today behind the reason I'm standing in front of you. That for the last 30 years, as the MC introduced, I have been fighting very hard to take my own bath right back in Nigeria. It was to the extent that when I found myself in the U.S. for 19 years, I spent 19 years in the U.S. between 1999 and uh, last year, or this year, I lived in the U.S. And I lived comfortably like most of you did. You know, I had kids there, got married. Uh, but I discovered something that, you know, that bath right of yours, you cannot regain it back from another man's land. Mm -hmm. And that there's nobody who's going to give you your bad rights, whether they call it naturalization, whether they give you unemployment uh, checks, or they even offer you a job, they give you free education. There is just nothing like being in your own space, living in your own country, and being happy in your own country. If anybody were to ask you in this room where you would rather be, with the same facilities you have here, I think the answer would be totally Nigeria. Where would you rather be with electricity? Where would you rather be with free education, health? Where would you rather be with the kind of infrastructure I've seen in uh, Australia? The answer would be Nigeria. Because it's no how well you can cheat it up here that it can be like home because that's where you come from. So I brought home to you or brought from home to you. Greetings from our people. I've been in Nigeria now for eight months, eight good months. Uh, leading a movement known as Take It Back. And about two months ago, we registered a political party known as the African Action Congress. And uh, I became the presidential candidate of that party less than a month ago. And I, before then, I've been traveling around Nigeria, having done 30 states in Nigeria, several cities. But I've also been under a lot of pressure to visit and meet with Nigerians all over the world. So over 100 events already done. And the conclusion I'm coming and walking around with is that Nigerians are looking for a country that they can call their own. Even for Nigerians who don't plan to go home, they want a Nigeria that is functioning. Even for Nigerians who are born outside of Nigeria, like our kids who are here, they are always talking about Nigeria. But sadly, the only information most of them have about Nigeria is the sad news that is constantly coming out of Nigeria. Uh, the sad news you are hearing from Nigeria, for those of you who are here, is not a place for sad news. It's deliberate. Nigeria 
has been designed by Nigerian leaders to be a place from where only sad news can come out. When you look at the mathematics, you look at the geography, you look at the administrative politics of Nigeria, the social, cultural, and traditional politics of Nigeria, only one result can come out of it. Sad news. If you look at the nature and character of Nigerian leaders, the only outcome of their leadership is sad news because we are saddened and bothered with very greedy and wicked individuals, human beings, sadly. And uh, in speaking like this on a Sunday in front of a lot of kids, I feel a little bad because most of them are looking for hope and uh, inspiration that you know, this country will become a better place one day. Yes, that hope and inspiration is right in front of you today. We are determined to change the narrative of the stories that are coming out of Nigeria, but we cannot do that ladies and gentlemen, without changing the objective conditions on the ground, without changing the leadership in Nigeria. And it is the reason why I'm here in Australia. Uh, my Nigerian time is uh, about 10 past 8 or 11 past 8. Australia is, uh, what time is it in Perth? Quarter uh, past 3. In Brisbane, it's probably like 5 p.m. It's I don't know, my body clock right now, I don't know where I am. <laughs> I, you know, I know where I'm in Nigeria, in Perth, Brisbane, Sydney, or Gabon. But we have to do this. And I'm glad that all of you are sitting down here today, willing to engage and interact about the best way forward for Nigeria. Uh, so I will be very glad to take a lot of questions and suggestions, a lot of comments, about what's going on in Nigeria. Typically what I do is to give a long talk, talk about how bad things are. But I know that most of you already know the story. And there's no point in repeating it to you. We repeat it to ourselves all the time. Everywhere you see three Nigerians gathered together having any conversation is about how bad things are in Nigeria. They're talking about Boko Haram, talking about Boko Buhari, you know, Atiku, or articulation of Obasanjo, or the people who destroyed Nigeria. Uh, but we can take back Nigeria, we can make Nigeria work, we can make Nigeria be better than even Australia. The reason I say so is simple. When Australia was built, or they made it like this, a long time ago, technology is such that if we have the right kind of leaders in Nigeria today, we can bring in new things that will totally just turn Nigeria around in such a way that even people in all these Western countries where we run to to become citizens and go on exile, whichever way we call it, will be jealous. They will be very, very jealous of what has happened in Nigeria. They will be surprised at what has happened in Nigeria. And the people that can make it happen are those of you who are sitting in the room today. Like, and also people at home who are also braving it at home. But the sad part about home is that most people in Nigeria who are still in Nigeria, they are just there trapped. They are waiting to leave. <laughs> That's the truth. That is my experience in the last eight months in Nigeria. If somebody were to go to Nigeria today and say, I'm issuing visas to anybody who wants to leave Nigeria, to go to Australia, the Kingdom, the US, 70 percent of Nigeria all Nigerians will leave Nigeria the same day. I'm telling you, that's how bad things are. That is of people that will be left are people who are probably unable to stand, walk to the airport, or go to the port. The rest of Nigeria are just waiting to... In fact, senators will be the first two to leave. Governors will be struggling to leave with Cyril country. They don't believe in a country. They made a country to become a country in which no human being wants to live in. So except those who are trapped in the place. But this could change. This will change. And why and how it will change is the reason I'm here today. We have seen the way the rest of the world is working. In fact, most of us here seated and what's helping other places around the world to function. We are the engineers 
designing and building roads and houses, infrastructure for Australia. I've met Nigerians before who are helping to shoot rockets into the space. I met a Nigerian who was one of the first people to design the plasma TV. There's a Nigerian in the US who can take a baby out of the womb, fix the baby to the back, and the baby will be born healthy. I heard there's also a similar doctor here in Australia, a Nigerian doctor, who has such marvelous capability. But if, you, if they head to Nigeria tomorrow, they will not leave the airport without being kidnapped. <laughs> you know, if they make it to where they want to do the work, the person that is supposed to receive them will tell them they don't need you here. If you bring a new idea, as you take the idea from you and ask you to get it away from them. If you keep coming back, they will hurt you. The place is so emasculated that there's almost no space, ladies and gentlemen, to do good in Nigeria anymore. And that is why there's the urgency of now. Urgency of why this intervention we're talking about must happen. And why all of you, regardless of whatever you can do to support, must intervene at this time. If you have financial support, it's great. But moral support is very important. In fact, sanctions, I'm recommending sanctions. I'm recommending since I started that people living abroad should sanction people at home. That if they don't vote for the right leaders this time around, there's no more Western Union transfer. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, we have been encouraging the listeners at home yes. by sending money at the slightest provocation. Anybody can make a story up, you send money to them. Somebody will ask you, um, you know, I'm sick. You keep sending money. When you get to Nigeria, you discover that it's building a house <laughs> for yourself. And they will refuse, however, to do anything about the situation that could make them stop waiting for Western Union from abroad. So those of you who are sitting here today are the biggest investors in Nigeria. You are the foreign investors, real foreign investors. You are bringing in over 50 billion dollars into Nigeria every year. That is officially, if you are sending through World Remit, Western Union recorded. But knowing Nigeria, when you want to send real money, you hide it inside the container. You know, to go to Nigeria for you, that's where money is. Or you go to the airport for somewhere to carry it for you. So if you add the way we send money unofficial, uh, the unorthodox way, we are probably sending some hundred billion dollars. So there's no country in the world, in the West, that is giving foreign aid of a hundred billion dollars to any country. In fact, the entire aid given to the continent of Africa is not up to what we send to Nigeria through uh, money transfer. So you must start sanctioning people at home. We started preaching by asking that you should force them somehow to get PVC, that's the permanent voters card. That before I send you my next chance of Western Union, I want to say a copy of you by WhatsApp. A lot of people did it, it worked. I'm telling you, it's not funny to you, but since we've been preaching it, it's worked. We found, found people as we're traveling in Nigeria, I said, if it's not for you, I wouldn't have got BBC with my brother in uh, Australia that asked me to get BBC. And now we're hearing from people, they say, they say if I don't vote for you, they don't go send me money again. No? <laughs> it's the way we have to take the bull by the horn, ladies and gentlemen. Because that country will be one of the best countries in the world. The whole world will be looking up to Nigeria in a matter of four years from now. But the whole world will be running away from Nigeria in a matter of two years from now. What is two years from now? If two of the major candidates of the two major political parties win the election next year, one of them will likely put Nigeria on eBay or Alibaba. <laughs> I'm serious, that's not funny. The other one will dissolve Nigeria in acid. That's Buhari. These two guys have no plans for Nigeria. One of them, I think, will spend $20 million in Potaka to purchase the, uh, the candidacy of the PDP. What do you think he will do when he becomes president? He's not going to pull back his money. One person 
probably has allocated over a billion dollars to spend election articles. And this is the same article that has been vice president twice in Nigeria, eight years under a battle. They are doing a custom officer. There is no way of explaining how he made this money. But we know how he made this money. There's a record of how he made this money through collection of bribery, you know, from Siemens and other companies in the archives of the US government website, if you Google it today. The next person is our lifeless ancestor. <laughs> when I say ancestor, I really mean it. Buhari is officially 76 years old. If he goes back to the hospital in London next year, he might add another one year. Anytime he sees his doctor, he adds one more year. But the reality is, his younger sister is 82 years old. Yes, Nigeria, this is, not, this is not a lie, we are hearing from the source. You know, Nigeria is 58 years old. The leader of Nigeria is 88 years old. I mean, what kind of country are we running? These people. We are not against them, by the way, because they are old. We are against them because of the age of their ideas. They have nothing to offer us anymore. The best they can offer Nigeria is what Nigeria is today. A broken country without infrastructure, a broken country without hospitals, a broken country without roads, a broken country without housing, and all of the good things you, you take for granted over here. Nigeria in 2018 is still celebrating the flickering of lights, what they call up Nepa in Nigeria. That is, if you get electricity turned on accidentally. In Nigeria, the office of the electrical of, uh, company that is known as Nepa, what they call PCL now, uh, PCL means Power has changed, and the problem has changed them. That's the name of that situation. They use generator to power their office. Yes. We, we done it before when we went to the office and we saw them uploading the generator at Nepal's office to power their own office. Those are the kind of contradictions that has been deadening our country, ladies and gentlemen. And if we then decide, which is simple, to change the situation through the elections that are coming in next year, February 16th, precisely the presidential election, to vote for a young person that has got integrity, a young person that has got exposure, a young person that has got education, a young person that has got capacity and stamina, uh, you will find Nigeria to be a different place in less than two and a half years. Why did I say so? Egypt just added over 34,000 megawatts of electricity to their national grid a few days ago. You guys probably heard about it. They built it in two and a half years. And it's a mixture of gas, solar, biogas, biofuels, biomass, you know, renewable energy and also fossil fuel, right? China built in nine years the longest bridge ever to be built by human beings between Hong Kong and mainland China. In the same last nine years that we couldn't figure out how to sign a contract, hear me, to conclude the refurbishment of the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. Just to sign the contract, it took nine years. By the way, they have been refurbishing it for the past 20 something years that I know of personally. They started refurbishing Lagos Ibadan Expressway, which is 120 kilometers since before I left Nigeria in 1999. I went back there in 2018. Some 18, 19, 18 years after, same old story. The other day, for those of you who follow us on Facebook, I was trapped on that road within the space of two kilometers for six hours. Because it's the only road that leads out of Lagos and it's permanently under reconstruction, not even construction now. Right? I came here 
And everywhere I was driven by those of you who have been assisting my travel here, it's always about construction. Everybody will point to me, this neighborhood used to be bush last two years. Now it's full of houses. And I was asking, these houses, are they, are they houses for rich people? Now, what are you talking about, rich people? These are council workers, regular people. In Nigeria, the kind of houses you live here that I see, Nigeria is only rich people that can afford to live in those places. But it's because the country, a nation here, is a nation state that cares for its people. And it's not as if you even have like some sound political system. I hear you change your prime minister like last captain every month. Maybe while we are here, you change the prime minister. Who knows? Because you are constantly never satisfied with the leadership. And you keep changing and asking for changes. You know, even those of you who are not even Australians, you're asking to change the Prime Minister of Australia. But those of us who are Nigerians, we can't change our leaders in 58 years. It's the same Buhari of 1983 that's still the president of Nigeria in 2018. And they will then have the audacity and the temerity to be asking young people for experience. Where would you get experience when they refuse to leave power? Do you get experience by working? When your father refuses to let you leave the house, how can you have experience to become the father? If your father refuses to allow you marry, how can you become a father to other children? So it's horrible. But we can change it and we can do it. And those of us who can do it have made ourselves available. I am one of the 79 candidates. That's wrong, but yes, 79. By yesterday, there are 79 candidates. Everybody that had the possibility of running for office. You know, the reason why there are 79 candidates is that Buhari made the presidency so cheap. Everybody thought they were president of Nigeria. Yes. So, and you can't blame them. If the president doesn't have YX certificate. So anybody who had TV day will not apply to the president of Nigeria. Even now, as of yesterday, he still couldn't submit his uh, YX. He said he's speak with the military. You are the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Your result is with the armed forces. Why should you write it in INEC form? I don't know where you are. So just tell the officers to release your result to IMEC. But the truth is that Buhari did not go to, did not do YEC. And you can tell it from his demeanor, you can tell it from the way he talks, that he's not educated. So there's no doubt about that. Even one of the traditional rulers in the north, the Emir Sanusi, said it today, that it's time for Nigerians to start voting for educated people. And I have no doubt that the Emir is referring to <laughs> yes, but they will slug it out between themselves. That's if they don't throw him before the election. <laughs> Anyways, this is why I'm here. I, I, I'm very relaxed today. I, I don't want to you know, make any big speeches. I want us to have an interactive uh, session together. This is my last city in, uh, in Australia. Hopefully after tonight, I'll get the chance to leave. Uh, this is a very huge country of yours. Head Australia is actually four times the size of Nigeria. Four times. Six. But everywhere you go in Australia, there's probably a road linking first to Brisbane. Yeah. Can you drive from here to Brisbane? Yeah. Awesome, right? Yeah. yeah, you cannot drive from Lagos to Abel <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making it up. You can start the journey because the when you get to it. Drive from here for two weeks to the road, you will get to Brisbane. Yes, that. You cannot get to Adelphuda from Lagos in a day. That's if you are lucky. You make it second day. So, please uh, thank you for coming again. You, 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 you are amazing people. And that you even after leaving Nigeria behind and most of you people when you left Nigeria you swore that you never have anything to do with Nigeria. <laughs> yes, everybody has got a story as to the reason they left Nigeria. And most of you are sitting here, also some of you left Nigeria thinking I'll be back in two weeks. And your two weeks became twenty seven days. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing that happened to me. 
But regardless, you have not left Nigeria behind. You know? Nigeria is also a very interesting paradox, right? No matter how you leave Nigeria, Nigeria doesn't leave you. It's like following you around, you know, wherever you go. So, thank you so much. Uh, again, I want to thank the organizers, not the organizers of uh, tonight's uh, event only, but the organizers of all the events I've attended right here in Australia, from Brisbane to Melbourne and Sydney yesterday. I am the only or the first presidential candidate in Nigeria to come looking for the presidency of Nigeria in Australia. First. In fact, you can count the number of Nigerian presidents who have never been to Australia. And how many times have been to Australia? Probably no more than 10 in the history of Nigeria. So I find myself very privileged and lucky to be in your midst. And I, I'm looking forward to an interactive uh, session this afternoon uh, to discuss how next year. Uh, we can start taking Nigeria in a different direction when I am personally sworn as the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you very much. Uh, put your hands together one more time for Shawari. When I say Shawari, you say take it back. Shawari! Take it back! We are taking that country back. For some of us who also go to Nigeria all the time, it saddens you. What you see here yeah, is you compare your brain. Just go back like in time to Australia and see you. Try to compare. It messes up with your head. I live in my, from my place, my house in Benin. Look at police station, look at my place. It's the only place where vigilante will be collecting money for security. Look at police station here. <laughs> On the same street that I live, opposite my house is Air Force Base. Man will be collecting money, a vigilante will be collecting money for security. And this is a country where a police, you are arrest for holding the thing. You hand over to police, police will hand over the thing to vigilante. <laughs> you go there ask yourself, who the guy you want for this country? But I will never go to Nigeria, go to Nigeria, sit down and look at the meter. The meter they are using, they are using card. The, 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 the way the thing moves, it moves, it moves like this, full of this men, the way they are killing people. Can't just go there back in that country. Please, we need to take it back. Honestly speaking, how much will you hear if you already stand here and begin to tell you? In fact, you don't even need to because you know you've seen, you've heard. It's just the attitude we need, we Nigerians. I keep telling people, let Tupac said, you cannot make somebody independent unless you make them grow. Grow them to become independent. And JFK, JFK Kennedy, late president JFK Kennedy, says one ignorant vote, your one ignorant vote will destroy your future and the insecurity of your nation. And that's what we beg in Nigeria. Time has come. People that have head, they don't, they can't think. Yeah, what do you call them again? Analog. I got that word from you. Analog leader. Analog brain, they are not thinking digitally. Can you imagine? We are taking it back. It's just me. Please, we support this movement. It doesn't matter how hard it is. We shall smile one day because I was playing Sony Okosu, late Sony Okosu, a few days ago. And tears came down my eyes. I said, Which way, Nigeria? Which way to go? He said, But I love my father. And I want to know which way, Nigeria. Go back in time and play. I'll be like this, uh, uh, Shaki Di Bobo, when they play now. All this crazy man. We go back and listen to people that play music of yesteryears. People like Bella. I posted something of Bella's page, uh, Bella's page on my, my account and I see what Bella said. These people, they are like prophets. What they prophesied back in the day is happening right now. But we need to change our rotation. Let's change our attitude. Once we change our attitude, our orientation about things will change. A room was not built in the day. Rwanda, in history, suffered the worst genocide in the world. Rwanda had the worst corruption. People were slain. 800,000 people massacred. But man, I have flown to Rwanda and rode my way to South Africa from Kenya. You will not believe how Rwanda is building a nation. 
You will see the one that you heard of many years ago. Go and look at the one that is one of the fastest developing countries in Africa right now. Because what? It's not the country that needs the branding, it's the leader that needs the branding. Because they are not thinking, we need to kick them out. Look at Ethiopia. A prime minister that went to a country, Egypt, and said, you know what? All the people you have detained, release them. They released all the Ethiopians and put them on the same aircraft and took them back home. They're doing amazing work. Right now, my people, Joe already has spoken. But that's not the end, it's just the beginning. It's just the icing on the cake. And that's the reason why we are here today, interaction. We want to have questions and answers now. Are you, have you prepared your question? And we've got a microphone in the middle, right? And I'll be passing this one to Mr. Showery. Please let us be conscious about no it. We are not we are all gentlemen and ladies. We are all kind, nice and easy. Any question you have prepared, it is time to ask this question. Let our children hear so that when they grow up, they can start to read and learn from it. It's questioning time, my people. I'd like to ask anyone, if you won't have any questions, raise up your hand and we will make your way. First question, please, uh, Professor Sholari, put your hands together. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. President of Nigeria by name Obasanjo arrived almost two hours late while the director of Nasima was speaking. And to my utmost dismay and disappointment, the director stopped the speech. There was a pandemonium in the hall. And everybody abandoned everyone and went straight to go and prostrate before Baba. I walked to one corner and I shook my head. That is why I said our problem should be centered on mind. I am I'm very glad. When I heard Mr. Shiori spoke about the strategy to hard rule our people in Nigeria, that practically answered the question of mindset. Because I called my people in Nigeria and I said, a young man by name Shiori is coming to Western Australia. And my brother said, Who is he? I said, Do you mean you don't know him? I said, well, we are only for Atiku anyway. 
So we don't know who you are talking about. We are tired of boring. So when children mention that create a sanction, this is a very, very powerful method. Whoever you are sending money to, tell him or her, this money is the last one coming to you if you don't show me anything that you want to change. God bless you for that answer show, right? When I ask my senior sister that you are a registered nurse and you are still struggling to feed your child, I say God is in control. I say leave God alone, please. <laughs> my question is, what do you want to do in the coming election? We went to church, we blew over it. I said, forget that message. I said, I preach myself in my church, but that doesn't make me a moral. I have to use my brain. So, the problem is, we look at ourselves here. A pessimist will say, oh, they are just wasting their time. Nigeria, they have already confirmed the election. Please, ladies and gentlemen, today, they started on a rough road. And the outcome of that rough road is what we are all enjoying today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Put your hands together one more time for the uh, pastor. Thank you. Just recycle the card, take it back like a ticket. All right, thank you everyone for coming around today. And uh, thank you, Mr. Sori. In fact, it's a privilege and an honor to stand in front of you today. And uh, I've got a couple questions to ask and I've got suggestions as well. But before I begin, I just want to congratulate you for one thing that you did. You know, and that was the standoff between you and the, I don't know if you still the Minister of uh, Communication or if you still, is it still the Minister? Yes. 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 Because that is just one thing. That is one thing that actually brought, you know, the consciousness of the youth. That's one thing that actually brought out that confidence. You know, that gave us a gift of hope that we can actually stand and face these people and tell them that, look, we're fed up, we're tired. You know, when I left the country, that was in 2013, I remember my experience. I was fed up. Even while going through a lot in school, you know, where you probably be in class, you're studying engineering, medicine, or whatever the course is, but you're sitting in the classroom asking yourself, of what benefit is this going to be to me? Because if we're like, you know, a nation of more than eight something million. And then we have people who are, you know, like, we've got more than two, three million who are in the same course. And then we're looking out there, looking at the future. We don't have any hope of job. So the question is, you're in class, you're competing consciously with your mates and unconsciously with the number of students who are. The reason, I don't know. They say you're traveling to Australia. I said, yes. And I was going to study. And they said, oh, can I see your visa, please? And I said, well, that is it there. I saw it was in a printed uh, A4 paper. And the guy looked at me and gave me a very funny smile. And he said, you're yeah, not going anywhere. And I said, what? He said, it's not in your passport. And I explained to him, I said, look, Australia has a new technology. Australia doesn't work like that. You know, our passport is the fact that, you know, there's an opportunity, I know, in, in the country, so many opportunities. We have a lot of coppers, I mean, new core members. So after school, we are being sent to different places, you know, different parts of the country to sell. Now, over here, there's what they call uh, medical insurance, you know, that covers everyone, you know, irrespective of where you're from. Even if you're coming from the country, you're not uh, a citizen of the country. You're expected to have some form of medical, you know, cover. A lot of you coppers have died. During my time, I mean, I've lost count, but during my time, I know that uh, I've lost more than close to a thousand people that I'm aware of that died during NYC. No medical cover. The last incident that happened the last time was a student was shot by the police. You know, she was taken to the uh, uh, medical center, to the hospital, and what happened? They said, oh, uh, we cannot do anything else except 
you know, you put some on deposit. You know, it's a challenge there. And I know that a lot of people are working towards it. I had a conversation with some people, some young individuals who were planning on setting up insurance just to cover you call members. And when they got to the point where they're about to establish, right, I'll round up now. They got to the point where they're about to establish that, what happened? They were faced with the same bureaucratic crap. So my question now is, I believe that you've got something that covers the Nigerian youth because the Nigerian youth makes up the country Nigeria. Um, I just want to share what your idea is and what you have to cover for uh, the youth of the country. Thank you very much. Put your hands together one more time. The gentleman, um, yeah, so I will be three questions. Three questions, every three. Okay, every three, okay, so you, okay, cool. All right, uh, please, we we have a lot of questions and please we try to make it very snappy. Max, two minutes, straight to the point, please, and now so that we keep moving. Thank you very much. Dr. Obalola, please. Now look at the United States in the, in the early 30s, 
When Stevens took, took over from uh, Jalama, he didn't know what to do in the Depression. The youth were galvanized. There was no money. Everything was costing money. The man just put all the youth to construction. They put them in camps. Government would feed them. They were doing all the construction, the road. All the highways in the U.S. can understand. That, that's how they all came about. The huge dams, all those. They used, they used to do that. So in Nigeria, I think the most power thing to do is, what kind of job are you going to do for them? Sholarin was, they didn't credit that to him now, but the idea of the National Youth Service Corps was Sholarin. They discussed that with, with, with the students before it came about. So the National Youth Service Corps, as it is today, again, is a wasting. It wants an opportunity to get youth across Nigeria to really know themselves. There's no point putting somebody in Lagos to do national service in Lagos. Let the person go to a private. So it's important to know Nigeria, know your people, and really remove all this artificial concept of tribalism and so on. When, by the time you finish in a private home, if you are not married, you might probably bring an acquired home wife home. You know, you get used to the cuisine there and all that. But the point I'm trying to make there is the youth in Nigeria now that, that you know, have nothing to do. Create the job, go and give them like a barrack, you know, use them like soldiers. Anywhere you need construction, put them there. They are sure of uh, accommodation. Government pays them a stipend, which can more than, you know, put boys and so together. And they are doing service. We don't need Chinese. So a lot of those people, they have left university, they have their own ideas about construction, brilliant engineers, they're all there. Let them tap those ideas and, you know, the closing is the energy thing. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so we need to look for all kinds of energy. Well, thank you, I think you're already on the right track on that one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we've got three. Yes, it's working. Yes, it's working. We've got three questions now. So we're going by three questions in a, in a row, like one, two, three, and then he'll nail it, and then we'll go one, two, three again. So the cards will be going around in number. So we're going to be going back to number one, two, three again. So. And three, four, okay, all right, okay. We no partialism. We're gonna be very um, partial here, okay. All right. I will hand over the microphone to show him. You ready? Yes. Uh, honestly, the last uh, three comments are not questions. It might be the suggestions that we can use. Okay. And some of them already we we already uh, on track regarding some of the suggestions. So. Uh, I just have to thank you and uh, hope that you continue to contribute ideas to our campaign. We are going to hit the ground running big time uh, starting November 18 when we start holding rallies around Nigeria. Uh, we have no doubt that we can win this. And uh, as soon as we win this, we will still need you again to bring uh, these dynamic ideas. What Nigeria is looking for is to stop the recycling of the same people that failed Nigeria and bring in people with fresh ideas, just like you have mentioned here, fresh leadership, people who are, who are making things work in other places. You mentioned the issue of doctors uh, who can treat people wherever they are. When I get sick in Nigeria, I get my treatment through telemedicine. I call my doctor in the U.S. This is how I'm feeling. And what is usually my biggest issue in Nigeria is stomach flu. Because you are picking a poor bee, you know, in Samara, and all the places, you pick stomach virus. And they tell you what to take, you're fine. The next one you call the doctor, I'm fine. So a lot of Nigerian doctors have actually spoken to me who are living abroad that they are willing to do telemedicine as far as it is possible. Just like no matter how you have a central number people can call and you know they have a card, a universal healthcare card, and you call that number and a doctor from Australia can treat you who is a Nigerian. Or you know, the call might go to the one in the US. And if somebody cannot take care of you, they can consult among themselves and say, look, this is a complicated case, they have a case meeting about it, and they treat you. These are possibilities that are already existing in places like Ghana. But our leaders, if you bring any new ideas to them, it's as if it makes them upset. 
when you bring any new idea, you look at you as if you have come to assault them and insult them. Who are you to come and tell us how to treat people in this country? Because you are living in Australia, because you are living in uh, America, who do you think you are? Me too, I've been to America before. All those kind of very petty, you know, uh, attitude is what is destroying Nigeria and it comes mostly with these analog brain leaders. We need digital thinkers. So I'll take the next three questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was being observed. I'd like to call on the card number three. Please introduce yourself and make it really snappy. And I will be interrupting if you go beyond time. Take it back. Action. Take it back. Action. I'm John and uh, I just have two questions. Um, I grew up in a school where, in a private school, I finished from a private school. And uh, I was in a situation whereby students in high school have to pay to get marks for project. Um, luckily, I was a senior um, head boy for that private school. Um, but we had the economics teacher who always collect money from students. I never partook in that. I never partook in that. And, but I got into serious problem with that particular teacher, actually, till I left, even though I was the head boy. Uh, what plans do you have um, in order to incentivize the students, the young ones, because those are the leaders of tomorrow, right? And that corruption mindset is already being built into them, even right from high school. So in that area, what plans do you have? Because it's not just about building more schools. We know we need more schools, obviously. But how do you plan to tackle that uh, situation um, in the mindset of the students? Another one is power. Power is very, very important. And the uh, doctor was talking about the Medicare card and all that. But without power, <laughs> Medicare card, it can't work. How will it work if there's no power? The card, so operate the card. Those who will be making the cards. I mean, I've been following the um, PVC collection and all that in Nigeria. And uh, a lot of people said they've been trying to get their PVCs for over three months. But they've not been able to get their PVC. They go there, they say, oh, they're still working on it. They say, they say printing it. So how do you plan to tackle that um, problem? Thank you very much. following you up on YouTube for a while now. And it's a pleasure to see you in flesh. Uh, I won't be wasting much of our time, I'll just to go straight to the point. Um, my question for you is basically um, how you want to, I mean, what structure do you have for the country? I'm talking of totality of the country. We have, you know, ethnicity problem. As we speak right now, Kaduna is on a shutdown, 24 hour curfew. How do you want to tackle Boko Haram? How do you want to bring the country together? How do you want to put a structure in ground, I mean on ground, to make everybody feel like this is the country that we belong to? We all love Nigeria, that's what we're talking about Nigeria today, and I'm um, very, very passionate about it. The very first time you started, I was telling my wife that it is a joke, but I'm beginning to believe in you now. She's the one that is actually pushing to say, yes, yeah, she believes in Shore, but I've been going through your YouTube and everything, I think you have strong passion for the country, and. Um, Basically, we, we, we want to see you there. We hope it's going to happen. So that's, the, that's my first question. What structure do you have in the ground that would kind of incorporate the whole country? Lagos, Anambra, up north, Bono, and you know, Yoruba, Southeast, and all of that. How do you want to bring us together? That's the first question. The second question is the health system. Now, um, doctors just spoke about part of it. I am a GP and I do ED part-time, emergency part-time. And I found out that since I got to Australia, it's difficult to die. If you get to meet me alive, to be honest, as, as I was shot, you know, 100%, I'm not saying maybe 10 people will come and two people will die. It is difficult to die. You come there alive. Provided you walk in or the ambulance box you alive, you will be alive. There's no way you can die. You know, everything, all the resources will be put in place, you know. But when I was in Nigeria, I did my housemanship in Lorient. You see all the all the images. <laughs> you see all the emergency people on the ground, you know, on the ground, and 
you know, they, and, they, and that's how, you know, they'll just be grasping uh, for life and they just die there. No oxygen, no nothing. So I think we should have a structure whereby there can be a proper emergency. Nigeria up to now does not have a proper emergency. So if we do that, we need to keep ourselves alive. It's only keep ourselves alive that we can fight for this movement and then we can make more youth, you know, to be alive. So I, think, I guess that's my question. Because of our time, I wouldn't go too much into what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Number five. I say, oh, that and that. Oh, no. Number five. Please go number five. Step forward, sir. Come that way, and I'll pass you on the microphone. Yeah. See, I don't know. Piki is safe. I never see Piki die here. I want to. Piki will not be for a bottle for 10 months. He will wake up. Uh, Mr. Shore, it's, it's really nice to meet you. Just like the last speaker, I didn't know much about you. I, I can say I wasn't so interested. But since you're here today, I said, let me come and see what's happening. But I can tell you that I'm now a fan uh, because I saw a few things. And I really wanted to take note of your groundedness. You know, when you were talking, it was like a human being talking. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like one high horse. It was like one of us talking, so I really wanted to keep to that. I also want to ask you maybe a very personal question. Uh, do you belong to a secret society? Uh, because when I look at you and look at every one of us here, it could have been any of us in the place. But I tell you, some of us are not that, uh, should I say it? Some of us are not that courageous. So what, what is behind? So, are we seeing chivalry or something will come up later? <laughs> I don't be frank with you, and that's why I'm a fan because I see someone that could do some things some of us could not do. And I also want to say that normally a system is more important than a person. So, how do you intend to surround yourself with the right people? Because we are seeing Shore now telling us and being grounded. Well, how, when you come up power, who are we going to see? You know. So if you could handle those questions, I have a few, but I'll give other people a chance. Thank you very much. Put your hands together, Mr. Ephraim. And you got three questions to answer now. Okay, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, the first question is about uh, how to tackle the mentality of. Uh, Young people, well, I think uh, Dr. Sulari mentioned that in the mind of our people. How do we take hold of the Nigerian human mind or the Nigerian mind such that it is not messed up uh, at a young age? And that's what the question the first person was talking about students. And I think one of the things I've always, always uh, known was that in growing up, our education system was better, even though we didn't have fancy schools, because we had mentors. We had people who came around when I was in primary school who were described as people of great character, and they would come talk to us and live, and we would be aspiring to become like them. But today, Nigeria, the value system has changed 360 degrees. If you grew up and the only person who made it in your village is a thief and is the one who drove the nicest cars, even the people who are honest go to him to ask him to pay the school fees of their children, who would you want to grow up like? It's a thief. So, and it's a country in which we do not visit consequences on people who do wrong. We praise them. Right? We go to parties and praise them. You know, singers will be singing their praises even when we know they are kidnappers, they are thieves, they are robbers. Just like uh, 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 Dr. Osolari was saying about Obasanjo, he came here and everybody started prostrating for him. 
It's the same thing I was at. I faced when I arrived in Nigeria to start campaigning. Everybody is like, what are you going to go see Obasanjo? What are you going to go see Obasanjo? And I keep asking them, which Obasanjo? Why would I, why should I go see Obasanjo? The same Obasanjo that prevented Awolo from becoming president in 1979. Through 2012, 12 to 12 is what they dreamt of at that time. Is it the same Obasanjo that said that Abiola is not the Messiah and he worked against him until they killed him. Same Obasanjo that was given a chance to run Nigeria for two consecutive times and said he was not satisfied, he wanted a third term. When they drove him out of his third term agenda, he went and brought a dead person to run Nigeria. I said, why would I go to his house? It's because the Nigerian mind has been so colonized that, as Jerry Rollins said when I met him in Ghana, the former president of uh, Ghana. He said the problem with Nigerians is that they are still in love with their oppressors. And until you separate them from their oppressors, until they start hating their oppressors, it's as, it's as if they have no future. So I think when people see consequences against those who do wrong in society, the human mind, the student, the young person will start understanding that they have to live an exemplary life. Right now, there's no basis for a person to live an exemplary life in Nigeria because criminals are the ones who are venerated in the country. They are the ones who get the most respect. You go to Lagos. Lagos is owned by one person. Jagaban. Yes. You go to Kumara State. It's owned by one family. The Saraki family. So, it's... it's Sometimes we start wondering, again, like I started, at what point did we sell our bat rights and how much? That's the question. Uh, number second question is, what structure to tackle Boko Haram is a general question, I get this all the time. Uh, or how do we bring people together? I'm telling you, bringing people together is not difficult, but they have to be done through justice. The question is to ask yourself, who is this in Australia that brings you together? Is there any day that you get a letter from the government of Australia that say, please so, we want you to come together. We want you to love the country. No. What makes you love Australia, for those of you who have changed your citizenship, is because Australia delivers to you social and economic justice. When you walk, you get paid. On weekends, in the U.S. that I lived in, you know, uh, for 19 years, if we don't get paid, it's like this world will come to an end on the big day. But we are waiting for that check to take you to the check uh, cash in place when I started there. You cannot even imagine not getting paid. It's unimaginable. But in Nigeria, it is a surprise to get paid <laughs> you know, at the end of the month. You will be wondering why did you get paid? What happened that the governor released money? There are governors who are owing 16 months of salary to their workers. And what they are owing is 18,000 naira per month. That same 18,000 naira translates to less than $600 per year minimum wage in Nigeria. Here in Australia, I heard that in two weeks, people who are unemployed against $600 every two weeks. That is more than the salary of a worker in a year in Nigeria. So, why would there not be unity when things are working? When we sang Nigerian National Anthem and the Australian National Anthem, I see the zeal with which people were singing at the Australian one. The Nigerian one, people were just like, let it finish, let it finish, let it finish. But the Australian one, I saw how you stood. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. It might sound funny to you. A country that doesn't believe in you, you can't believe in that country. But if a country is taking care of you, even if you hear the national anthem in your sleep, you stand up. <laughs> but the Nigerian national anthem, I beg, don't try that thing in front of some people. Even. There are parts of Nigeria where if you go and play national anthem, they will beat you up. <laughs> because the country is not serving them in any capacity. I can't help but laugh at the question because who said it's difficult to die here. 
but it's real, right? Because all it takes you whenever you are sick in this part of the world is to get to hospital. Or for hospital to get to you. Yes. One day in the US, my son, I was betting my son in what I he had seizure. And we thought he was gone. We just laid him on the on the table and it was snow. And we tried to drive out of the house with him. The snow blocked our car. The ambulance came. And the ambulance guy came down, the major one of them, one of the eight, hooked him up with this and he said, Oh, I found a pulse. And after he said he found a pulse, he said, Well, you should stop crying, he's still alive. In Nigeria. There's no way they can find that point. It's <laughs> true. You know? Because the person who's coming is not coming with first aid. You know? There's no way an ambulance will come to your house to pick up somebody to go to hospital in Nigeria. I've never heard it before. When people have accidents in Nigeria, our humanity has been so strict that They'll be looking in their pocket for their cell phones. They collect it first. Yes, that's the first priority for most people. Collect their cell phone wallet. Then they'll see who is still alive. It's okay. They'll help you stop the vehicle. Take them to the hospital. But most of the time, you get to the hospital, there are no doctors there. You know? Or when you get to the doctor, the doctors are even wondering why is it that you have not died? Before you go there, they look at you and say, if you are still alive, Misery, just end your misery. That Nigeria is the only place on Sunday where churches are praying for people to die, 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 die. you know, or invoking fire. And there are no firefighters in the country. <laughs> it is part of the way the mind is set up. Somebody said beside me here when you say that people are it's very hard to die. I said I know witches and wizards here yeah. in Australia. What happened to the Nigerian witches who came to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Where did you leave your witches and wizards? Is it only the people without witches who are not witches who got wizards? <laughs> so many of you, before you came here, you were regarded as witches because you are poor. You were regarded as witches because you were sick. You were regarded as witches because you couldn't pass exams. Anytime you want to look for a job and you didn't get a job, you always start suspecting your sister. You know, or your grandmother. Or the village people. I know people who don't go to the village because they believe that all the villages are made up of witches and wizards. When I took my kids to Nigeria for the first time, everyone was like, you better take them out of the village. I said, for what? Ah, you know witches are here. <laughs> I said the worst witches are based in America. <laughs> if they don't kill them, there's nothing they can do to them. Of course, there are not witches anywhere, there are not wizards everywhere. But when you don't have hospitals, what do you expect? What they are saying is that if my kids get sick in the village, practically there's no hospital that I can take care of them. I said you fly them out of the country and before we get to the airport, they'll probably be dead. So, trust me, we just have to take it back. We have to take our country back. And the moment we do that, we, we will kiss all the witches and wizards go back. Mm. The witches and wizards will also be dancing shaku shaku. You know, because there is a correlation between lack of electricity and witches and wizards. The moment there is electricity, there is no witches out there in the They go to the village of darkness. <laughs> Secret society, somebody asked me a very interesting question. I belong to secret society. It's very, very interesting because when I was at the university, uh, one of my biggest challenges was being a student union leader at the University of Lagos. And we had a problem of secret societies, court gangs, as they call them, called them secret courts. And <clears throat> we had to fight them. And we had to fight them. And when we were fighting on campus, I was asked the same question. Where did you get the courage from to go and confront secret courts? Are you a secret court yourself? And my question was very easy. Is that if somebody had courage, you won't need to be a member of a secret society. 
Yes. If you are brave enough, it's people who are not brave who need to join hands in secret with some people to fight. But if you are brave enough, you don't need to act in secrecy. I can say the way I am now and is the way I've always been since I got to the university in 1989. The way I am now was the way I was when I was behind Abiola in 1992. The reason I was behind Abiola in that video, I'll tell you today. Abiola gathered all these politicians behind him. They were collecting money from him. So I went to see him to tell him that students are going to fight the anomaly on the June 12th election. As usual, Abiola stammered and said, ah, student leader, thank you for coming. He grabbed 800,000 naira. Bam. You know, the man is always giving out money. And I told him, I said, Chief, what for? Is that for you people to, to, to go out and keep fighting against the against Vagina now? I said, Chief, I'm not here to collect your money. I'm not fighting the Vagina because of you. I'm fighting the Vagina because of my own future. And you don't need to bribe me to fight for my own future. So, Abdullah was shocked, you know, because I was wearing slippers. He said, what kind of person are you that did not ask for money, and when I gave you, you did not collect? He said, come, come next to me, I'm going to address the media outside. I want you to be the person standing next to me. At that point, most of the politicians that collected money from you had abandoned Abdullah and went to Babangida to be collecting money. That was the history of why I was standing behind Abiola in 1993. In 1993, I was 21 years old. Yes, about 21, 22. Today, I'm 47 years old. I'm still standing on the same pedestal of what is right for Nigeria. And also refusing, refusing to be bribed by people who have stolen Nigeria's money. If I wanted to make money with Sahari waters, I would have made so much money, I would have bought an island very close to Australia and I'd be living there by myself. Because each time I wrote a story against the rich people, they, the first attitude is, what do you want? And when I tell them that you cannot afford what I want, they look at me and say, there's nobody we cannot bribe now. We have bribed this place. They will name all the journalists and how they bribe them. But I said, there has to be one person that you cannot bribe, and that would be me. That's been where I stood. To answer your question, I do not belong to any secret society. And I have lived my life very transparently, including in this presidential campaign. I'm raising money transparently. As of today on GoFundMe, I saw that we raised $89,000. Wow. Wow. Yes. Our goal is to raise two million dollars, not Canadian dollars or not Australian dollars, U.S. dollars. But I heard U.S. dollars is stronger than uh, Australian dollars. Two million U.S. dollars, with which we can defeat this old guy. And we are well on our way to raising that money. And I'm sure we will reach you can that destination. Just to Whichever way the video, it is, the we are getting the kind of support way, that we okay. never Everybody in the video come as well. away. The you other day we were in Melbourne, a doctor who came and said he never also believed in me before now. He thought I was working for Amici until he watched the video on YouTube and saw that I fought Amici before and recorded it. He gave me thousand dollars right there, the medical doctor. We know there are a lot of you who can afford to fund this revolution. So you are not convinced yourself that you won't have it. But for me, and I want to be very clear, it's not about money. We can have all the money we want and still not win the election. But we have all the will we need to fix this between this election, even when we don't have a lot of money. So that's what I tell you. So, no secrecy in my life. I do not believe in secret societies. I don't believe we need to do anything in secret. The countries that are doing well are countries that are doing things transparently. 
and the government that will bring next year will be a government that is completely transparent. I intend to declare my assets. I intend to make sure that anybody who is working in my government, the assets are declared and uploaded on the website, on the federal government, or a special website that is accessible anywhere. I intend when we recover money from chiefs, that we make them available to the public to know from whom we recover the money and how much we recover. Those are things that we had a claim we would do when he came to power. He never did any one of them. Since today they claim they are recovering money, you don't know from whom they recover the money, how much they recover. They just tell us they are recovering money. We recover 320 million naira from Abacha in Switzerland. The day the money arrived, we went to China to borrow 320 million naira. You know, these guys are not only wicked, they are also idiots. I'm sorry to say. So let's take the next three questions. Number six and seven and eight, get ready. People are also using that to console themselves. So um, I will just, it's just like a suggestion and like a question, uh, just to tell you that probably if you want to get uh, people, a large number of people in a place, uh, I'd like you to look into going to um, fed, uh, uh, conventions, church religious organization uh, programs, like the experience, they normally do the first Friday of every. December, where you can get uh, organized by Paul at the Pharisee, and you can get a large number of youth there, and also uh, uh, six million people gathered in redemption camp every December. You can also get the villagers, the marketers, everybody there. Then, uh, then my last, my last sorry, sorry about that. My last question is uh, is about um, if I remember, yes. My last question is, what are you, what, are, what, what is your plan towards uh, getting the biodata of Nigerians? Because um, there's no data in Nigeria, so what are your plans, what are you planning to do about that? Thank you very much. Please don't buy it, get ready. So I've been to Nigeria once and I found something quite eye-opening. Um, but firstly when I was there I um, saw that the electricity wasn't working and when I was at my grandmother's place there was one day where we had three days without electricity. Like it may not seem like a big deal but not having electricity is kind of bad and I was wondering what you and your party would do to make sure that electricity was working more efficiently and better for the people. And I also noticed that after 8 p.m. it was safe to leave your compound where your house was and it was due to thieves or even the police around. Um, how are you and your party going to combat police brutality and also protect the people of Nigeria? Thank 
you. Giants that God could 